Well, hello again, everyone. Thanks for checking back in with the Straight A Nursing Podcast. And this one will probably be pretty short and sweet. A lot of you are in finals or wrapping up the semester. Maybe you're graduating. And maybe you have other things to do besides study nursing. But in case you don't, this podcast will talk about something that will help you prepare not only for your clinical rotations, but also for your life as a working nurse in the acute care clinical setting. And what we are talking about today is simply some very basic, very key assessments that you're going to perform, if not every single time you interact with your patient, then just about every single time you interact with your patient. And it becomes one of those things that you start doing very automatically and without even realizing you're kind of ticking through the list of things. But of course, when you're starting out, it is a little bit more of a formalized process and then as you gain experience and exposure to lots of different patients, lots of different scenarios, these five key assessments all kind of meld together and they become what I call your spidey sense or your nursey sense. And that is the ability to look at someone and know they're sick or they're in trouble or they need help. So key skill to have and don't be discouraged if you don't have it right away. It takes years to develop that and a lot of exposure, like I said, and experience looking, touching, listening, smelling, talking to a lot of different types of patients. So with that said, we will start. And these are in no particular order, but essentially these are the five things that you're going to assess every single time you interact with your patient or very close to every single time. The first thing we'll talk about is pain. Very simple, right? Well, not so simple because guess what? People lie about this, over-exaggerate this, under-exaggerate this, don't understand that zero to 10 means zero to 10 and not, oh, my pain's a 12. That doesn't make any sense. Um, People will say it's a five and a half. (laughs) Just a zero to 10, people. Um, So aside from asking people what their pain number is, if you are dealing with someone who's alert and oriented, the pain number scale is kind of the the main scale. There's also the faces scale where you have them point to the picture. Um, This can be helpful for someone, maybe they don't speak your language and you're just doing a quick pain assessment, you're not pulling out the interpreter phone every single time you walk in there and you just wanna know what their pain is, they can point to a picture. Um, There's other pain scales. The one I use the most is the CPOT, the critical pain observation tool, I believe is what it goes by. And we use this on people who are um, really sick or not able to to participate because they are sedated Maybe they're on a ventilator or they're just so sick they can't tell you a pain number or point to a picture. And the CPOT is things like um, you look at their face. Are they grimacing? Um, Are they moaning? Are they crying? If they're on a vent, are they coughing? Are they tolerating the vent? Or are they fighting the vent? Are they restless? Are their muscles rigid when you try to move them? So things like that tell you what the pain is. So anyway, pain is something that you're going to assess a lot with your patients. I mean, and you're required by law, I guess, by chart- the charting law to do so probably hourly. I think it's hourly in most places if you're treating the pain. If it's you're not treating them for pain, a lot of places have backed off that a little bit and you can go to every two hour pain assessment. So just know what your facility wants you to adhere to and make sure that you are assessing pain. And what you wanna do with this is, is more than just asking them, what's your pain on a zero to 10 scale, Mr. Johnson? But knowing that people maybe 
have a hard time with that. I don't know why it seems so simple, but watch them. You know, are they are they moving in bed? If they say their pain's a two, but they haven't taken a deep breath since they had surgery, that's an issue, right? So they are in more pain than a two. Um, are they guarding? Are they limiting how much they move? If somebody says, oh, I feel fine as long as I don't move. Well, that's not that's not a good answer. We want them to move. We don't want people just lying in bed, getting blood clots and pneumonia. So you need to assess how they look, how they act. And if someone's refusing pain medication, which people do refuse pain medication because they have this fear that they're going to get addicted, then you have to do a lot of patient education and explain to them you know, we need you to be able to move and take deep breaths and cough. And if you can't do any of those things, then we need to give you pain medicine and you're not going to get addicted in the two days that you're on IV morphine or the four days you're on, um, uh, what is that step? Norcos. So, um, lots of patient education there. And then of course, at the other end of the scale is the individual who is laughing, chucking it up with their friends eating some KFC that somebody brought in and you ask them their pain and it's always a 10. It's always a 10, always a 10. So I'm not going to say that they're drug seeking, but people like, I mean, we give really good drugs in the hospital and people like them and you just have to kind of temper their response with your assessment of them and deciding what dose of medication to give. So pain is one of those tricky ones. I, I do believe there is an opioid crisis in our country, and I think a lot of it has to do with us treating pain as this fifth vital sign, and it's what the patient says it is. And if they say they have pain, then give them the max amount of pain medication, and a lot of that too. Honestly, this is maybe controversial, but stems from those press Ganey surveys where I don't know if these questions are the same as they've always been, but I feel like one of the questions is, was your pain treated? And people are under the assumption somehow that they're going to go to the hospital, have surgery, and have no pain. That's not happening. Um, I've heard patients tell me that their surgeon told them after a 10-hour back surgery that they would have no pain because they were going to be in the ICU where we could manage their pain. And that's a flat out lie. I'm just going to say that right now. So one of the things that you can do with your patients when they are post-surgical or have a procedure done is say, you know, what did your surgeon tell you about your expectation for pain management? Find out where they're coming from. And if they say, oh, I was told I would have no pain, so... I need pain medicine for a pain score of two. I need some Dilaudid. That's, well, that's not realistic. But um, you need to educate them that there is some pain after surgery. It's not going to be a zero. Um, usually people, you can talk to them and educate them and ask them, so what is your acceptable pain level? You know, zero is no pain at all. One is slight discomfort. Two is, you know, and you can go through kind of the descriptions of what a zero to ten sounds like. One of my favorites was one of the nurses I work with who is just the funniest guy. And I love to listen to him talk to patients because he's just so, <laughs> he's hilarious. And I heard him, I mean, he says it all with such a straight face. And he's talking to the patient. I hear him doing the uh, initial assessment kind of interview thing that we have to do. And he's telling them about pain and asking them their pain score. And he says, you know, zero is no pain. And 10 is having your arms ripped off. <laughs> So it's just, you know, 10 is like supposed to be the absolute worst pain that you can imagine ever being in. So really, I think maybe passing a kidney stone and birthing a child are probably, and, and having your arms ripped off are probably some of the few instances where you are going to have 10 pain. But you'll see everybody at the hospital is having 10 out of 10 pain, 10 out of 10. I need, I need Dilaudid and they'll ask you to, some people will even ask you to slam it. Don't do that. They're just looking to get high. You can be straight. Tell people you're not a drug dealer. You're going to give them their IV pain medication slowly. 
as it is safe to do so because you don't want to tank their blood pressure or knock out the respiratory drive. But anyway, just some things that you, you'll see. You'll see when you get into the hospital and you start working. Um, just some of the people are interesting. I will say that. Okay, so that's pain. Probably just as dangerous as, well, maybe not just as dangerous, but just as concerning of people overestimating their pain is the individual who underestimates or underreports it, and then they don't move, they don't cough, deep breathe, they don't get up and walk, they develop a blood clot, they develop pneumonia, they develop complications. So you want to treat the pain to the point where they can participate in their care. That's that. That's pain. Okay. So the next thing that you will always want to be checking your patient for is how's their respiratory status. And checking someone's respiratory status goes way beyond pulling out your stethoscope and listening to their lungs. You can get a lot of information just talking to them or watching them from the bedside, sometimes even from the doorway. I had a patient whose wheezes were so bad you could hear them from the nurse's station. So um, being keyed into the respiratory status at all times is key. You want to look, are they working hard? to breathe. Are they tachypnic or are they breathing really slowly? Are there sounds that you can hear even without a stethoscope? Sometimes you can hear, I've heard wheezes without a stethoscope, definitely. Um, I've heard coarse, wet lung sounds before without a stethoscope, okay? You can hear if they've got something gurgling in the um, oropharynx area, something that could be causing an occlusion. You can definitely hear that. Are they gasping? Are they in Kuzmal's respirations, highly distinctive respirations when a patient has a very high blood sugar and ketoacidosis? Um, maybe they're breathing very shallow, possibly because of pain or some other issue going on. Get them to talk if you can. If they're only speaking a few words at a time, like two to three word sentences, that is a big sign that they are short of breath. If they are yelling from their bed and you can hear them throughout the unit and they're yelling over and over again, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, they're breathing. Okay, they're fine. They're having maybe an anxiety attack or a panic attack or are attention seeking, but if you're yelling nonstop, you're breathing just fine. Um, Find out if they sleep propped up on pillows. Um, maybe they're tripoding. So you're looking at all of these things as you're assessing your patient, talking to them, having a conversation, seeing what they, you know, if they want to get out of bed. Watch how they breathe during activity versus just laying there watching the news. So respiratory status is another big assessment that you're going to get really good at, and you don't even need your stethoscope to do a basic respiratory assessment. The other thing you'll be looking at with your patient every time you're in the room is what does their skin look like? Um, normal is warm, dry. The whatever color for their race is appropriate. You want them to be that color. Any um, paleness duskiness, modeling. These are all signs of poor perfusion and would be a cause of concern. Diaphoresis, you know, that's not good. That's a sign that there's something going on with the heart, possibly. So look at their skin signs. I had a patient somewhat recently and she had a lot of, a lot of things going on, but one of the things that really clued us in that there was a serious perfusion issue was the fact that her skin signs were so poor, um, duskiness, modeling, the beginnings of modeling, things like that. So I know patients are covered up, they've got their gowns on, they've got sometimes a sheet or a blanket. You got to pull that stuff back. You got to look. So protect the privacy, shut the curtain. When you do that first big head to toe, right, you, can, you need to look at their skin, get down to their skin. And then from there, you can assess as you need to, but at least in the very beginning, you need to look at the skin on their torso, their chest, their thighs. You need to look at all of it. 
Um, not to mention their back because we want to really keep those pressure ulcers at bay. So you got to check out everybody's backside as well. Um, another big thing that you will be assessing with your patient, probably not every time you walk in the room. It depends on whether they have a Foley catheter or not. But you're really going to watch urine output. More so if they are critically ill or you suspect that they have some kind of renal impairment, poor perfusion, poor cardiac output, sepsis, dehydration, anything that would cause your urine output to go down or way up, like maybe diabetes insipidus, a tumor in the brain, any, any of those things. So you're going to watch urine output. Um, you're looking at half a mil per kilogram per hour for your patient. Um, I know 30 mils per hour seems to be kind of the standard, but really if you wanted to be super exact, you'd go 0.5 mils per kg per hour for your patient. So just kind of eyeball it. You'll get a feel for, hey, that doesn't look like enough and it's really dark, or hey, I just emptied that and now it's full over time. And if you're doing a critical eyes and nose, you will be getting exact, like 42 mils versus 40 mils an hour and keeping a very close eye. You're looking for the urine to be clear, yellow, kind of straw colored is, is ideal. It's often not. Anything else, you need to look at it in a little bit more detail. Like, is it blood tinged? Well, that's an issue. What are their platelets? What are they doing? Why are they bleeding? What's their PTT? What's their proton? What's their INR? What's, um, what do the coags look like? Um, did they have some trauma to the bladder or the urethra? Things like that. Is it, uh, is there sediment? Do they have an infection? Is it really dark? Were they in rhabdo? Is it kind of green? Are they on propofol? Like all these things that you will investigate if your urine is anything but clear and kind of straw colored and in the appropriate amount. So another thing that you will be doing, and this is number five, see how fast we went through those? And this is probably the one that I would say is the most important and it's level of consciousness. So you will be checking their LOC all the time. Even if you're not, you're not doing a neuro exam. I'm not talking about going in there and having them squeeze your hands and stick out their tongue and shine a light in their pupils. I'm just talking about their level of consciousness. Are they alert? Are they responding to you? Are they responding to you appropriately? Are they oriented? Are they aware of where they are, why they are there, who they are, when they are, etc.? Can you have a conversation with them that makes sense? Are they following commands? So doing things like that with every assessment, like knowing if a patient is following commands, you don't have to say, show me two fingers, Mr. Smith, but, you know, open your mouth. I'm going to take your blood pressure or I'm going to, you know, take your temperature or can you hold your arm up while I take your blood pressure, get this cuff on, you know, are they following commands? It doesn't have to be so formal as show me two fingers or give me a thumbs up. Now, if you're doing a neuro assessment on a patient who's sedated and vented and all of that, you will ask them to do those very specific things because you want to make sure that, yes, they heard you. Yes, they're following. When their response might be very muted, you want to make sure that you have a very clear direction for them to follow. And uh, squeezing, squeeze my hand is not the best because people will squeeze reflexively, um, especially with neuro damage. So that's why we say, show me two fingers or give me a thumbs up or something like that. So you want to watch their level of consciousness. I had a patient recently who was in some respiratory distress. And when they first got to the unit, you know, breathing pretty hard, you know, working really hard to breathe, but talking able to participate, didn't really feel like participating because the shortness of breath was pretty pronounced, but definitely moving everything, actually a little restless, which can be a, a sign of hypoxia. You get restless, and then guess what happens as your carbon dioxide goes up? You get somnolent. So there was this period of restlessness and then followed by somnolence. So a definite change in LOC. Of course, you know, we got a blood gas right away. Uh, check a blood sugar when someone's LOC drops. You want to check a blood sugar, make sure their sugar is okay. Um, I believe the CO2 was a little high. Um, CO2 makes you very sleepy and you go night night. Uh, so with patients like that, you can pop them on BiPAP. Typically what happens is their uh, CO2 will normalize and then they wake up and then they get really annoyed because BiPAP, I can't imagine how uncomfortable it is, but most people don't like it. 
And um, a common scenario is someone with COPD, patients with COPD already, for my general, I'm generalizing here, from my general experience, have this kind of anxiety about their breathing, which is completely understandable. Feeling, you know, at any time that you're not getting enough air would be very anxiety provoking. So they're just kind of higher anxiety patients to take care of. And, you know, they'll come in with their COPD exacerbation and maybe they're not on BiPAP right away, or maybe they come in and they become somnolent and they get put on BiPAP in the ER and they come up to the ICU and the CO2 normalizes and they wake up and they want that BiPAP off because they don't like it. So they take it off. (laughs) Then they get feisty for a while and you can't get the BiPAP back on because they just start fighting you and they're taking it off and they're being really difficult. And then they get sleepy again and their CO2 goes up and then they, they kind of don't fight you as much or argue and you put the BiPAP back on and then they wake up and then they want the BiPAP off. And it's just this ridiculous cycle. I wish BiPAP was more comfortable because I cannot imagine wearing it. Anyway, so those five things, let me just recap real quick. Pain, respiratory status, skin signs, urine output, and level of consciousness. These are kind of the things that you're going to start noticing you assess even when you're not thinking, oh, now I will look at their skin. You are just, you're going to just take it all in. And it's going to form, like I said, this like spidey sense. And you'll get to that point where you'll say to yourself or to your nurse colleagues or your physician friends, something's going on with my patient. They don't look right. And even if you don't have the the exact right idea of what is wrong with them, even just knowing, hey, you know, her skin is dark. She's a little dusky. Her LOC is low and her urine output's really decreased. That's enough right there for you to convey to the to your team that there's something wrong and this patient is sick and needs a little bit more attention. So anyway, that is kind of how you will start to develop your spidey sense, your nursey sense. Key skill takes time. Don't worry about it. Watch how other nurses do it and and then feel free, if, especially if they're amenable to teaching, you know, how did you know that patient was going to go south? Or how did you know that they needed BiPAP? What were the signs? What did you see? And you can learn a lot from people that way. And then from yourself, just watching your patients, assimilating all that data, comparing it to the treatments that were given and how they responded. And all of these things kind of circle in your brain and develop this awesome ability to develop just grow that intuition and become a really great nurse, which you are going to be if you aren't already. So that is it. Like I said, short and sweet. We're at 23 minutes right now. And I apologize if you guys could hear the saw in the background. My husband's doing this big project. He's always doing some big project. If you've been following the website, you know, we've been doing a little remodel on our house. So he's doing that. And if you might hear the door slamming every now and then, that's the door downstairs and he doesn't know how to shut it quietly so I apologize anyway come back next week I think we'll do a pod quiz next week we haven't done one in a couple of weeks and we're due I'm not sure what the topic will be maybe it will be a surprise and that's about it I think NTI is happening this week a friend of mine is there right now wish I could be there I have family that comes up this time every year so doesn't ever really work out but maybe next year I can fudge the dates a little bit and and go. I think it's in Boston next year. It's in Houston right now. And I'm so jealous of everybody that's there. Uh, I totally wish I could be there. It'd be so much fun. But I promise I will go sometime and maybe I will see you there. Anyway, that is it for me. If you have not checked out the website, if you are finding this podcast just from being on iTunes looking for nursing stuff, awesome. But the website is straightanursingstudent.com. is full of information for nursing students and new nurses. You will love it, I promise. If you don't, your money back. Just kidding. It's all free right now. I am working on some premium content for you guys because I really want to step up the game over there. So look for that sometime. I think when I grow another set of arms and 
basically clone myself, I'll get my uh, get everything the way I want it to be. If you are looking for help in nursing school, maybe you're struggling or you're getting ready to start and you're super nervous, then you can check out my book, Nursing School Thrive Guide. It has a five-star rating on Amazon, you guys. I cannot believe it. I mean, I believe it because I think it's awesome, but I'm just so just amazed and humble that I can help so many people in, in such a great way. So check it out if you're interested in how to survive, not just survive actually, but thrive in nursing school. That book is Nursing School Thrive Guide, paperback, ebook, and audiobook. So that's it for me today. Thank you very much and have a fantastic, wonderful, beautiful day. podcast is a production of straightanursingstudent.com, copyright Mo Media.